Well, hello and welcome to Thought Leaders, Eric Dishman and Joe Velderman discuss technology use in long-term care. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Content Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. In just a moment, I'll be introducing our speakers as today's webinar is about hearing these experts discuss the outlook of technology in long-term care and how electronic medical records can benefit your organization. Let's get started as we do have a lot to cover. We've invited you along with over 275 professionals representing 34 states and provinces, all interested in learning more about the trends and use of technology in long-term care. Before we get started today, I'd like to take just a moment to say thank you to our sponsor, Intel GE Care Innovations. For those of you not familiar with Intel GE Care Innovations, they're a unique joint venture between Intel Corporation and GE. Each company has a long history of driving innovation, solving hard problems, and creating new markets. Care Innovations is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, connecting people with their care teams, and giving them the confidence to live independently. To learn more about our sponsor, you can visit www.careinnovation.com. But for now, let's get on with our show, and we'll move to our first poll for the day. So folks, we would love to hear from you. What are your top two priorities when it comes to electronic health records? What are your top two priorities? Is it improving care coordination, reducing health care disparities, engaging patients and their families, integration with third-party vendors, hospitals, RX labs, or ensuring adequate privacy and security. Now, you'll notice you can select as many as you like, but we're asking you on the honor system today to go ahead and give us your top two. We've got 84% saying improve care coordination, 33% reducing healthcare disparities, 18% saying engaging patients and their families, 51% integration with third-party vendors, hospitals, pharmacies, labs, 20% ensuring adequate privacy and security. So um, very interesting results. Thank you for sharing them. I know that our speakers will find those results helpful as they walk through their content today as well. Hope you find it interesting too. We are very excited to bring you two real thought leaders who will shed light on your industry. Today's program includes thought-provoking material on healthcare technology and an educational portion on the use of electronic records in long-term care. I know we're all very interested in learning what these two experts are about to share with us. So our first speaker is Eric Dishman. And Eric Dishman is the Director of Health Policy at Intel. Eric is responsible for public policy, uh, industry groups, and evangelism at Intel G Care Innovations. He is widely recognized as a global leader in healthcare innovation, especially home and community-based technologies for chronic disease management and independent living. The Wall Street Journal named him one of 12 people who are changing your retirement. And the magazine Fast Company named Dishman to its list of the 100 most creative people in business 2011. Recently, his work was featured on the Discovery Channel's Curiosity Project. We want to thank Eric for the time he's dedicated for this interview. And we're fortunate to catch him between his work on the Curiosity Project and countless other meetings, speakerships, and advocacy work that he does in the healthcare sector. Upon meeting with him, I asked Eric about his vision on the future of healthcare and the role that technology can play in long-term care. And in response, Eric shared with me three pillars of healthcare that he's focused on. Let's listen to what Eric has to say. There's three elements of this that Intel's been working on and, and that we're observing around the world in the more than 20 countries where we work on health innovation and health reform. Um, the three pillars of this personal health that we see are care anywhere, care networking, and care customization. And sort of break those down a little bit. Care anywhere is really about um, unchaining care from the notion that you must travel to an institution or to a place for care and that because of the mobile technologies and the social technologies and um, you know, diagnostic technologies being able to move out from a hospital or a nursing home and into our homes or into our everyday lives, 
suddenly care is able to occur anywhere, and that means that the professional care providers need to be able to deliver care from anywhere, and folks needing care should be able to receive that care from the place of their choice, whether that's their home or their workplace or even their car or as they go. It's not that we won't have hospitals, and it's not that we won't have some nursing homes, and it's not that we won't have some clinics. It's that we need to use those tools when they are most needed. But the reality of it is we have enough technology and know-how today that would allow care anywhere to occur. We think, for example, that 60 to 70 percent of care that's delivered in a hospital today can be done safely and effectively at home. Uh, and we're just not wired that way as a planet. We spent so long building these huge... Uh, megaplexes and they're very expensive and they, they perform miracles when we travel to these places that put us back together again but it's simply not scalable and sustainable so, so care anywhere is a big important part of the strategy that, that it's not so much our strategy it's just a reflection of what's happening in the world and we want to make sure that there's technology to support that and the second is care networking and that's really about moving from a model of sort of the solo specialist treating a particular organ or a particular disease to a team of, of mixed discipline providers and you on that team and your family members who are part of your care team on that team being trained to deliver collective care. You know, what are the social networking technologies that are going to connect you all together for real-time access so everybody on the team knows what's happening? And what are the technologies for decision support that are going to help the different specialists and train you as a, a patient to do more of your own self-care and train your family members to help you know, provide care? There's simply not going to be enough doctors and nurses in the world in which we double and then double again the number of older people in a 50-year period. We're not going to keep up with enough professionals for the need. These models of self-care, neighbor care, family care have to be there. But those folks can't be left sort of thin for themselves. They need to be trained and included as part of a care network with the professionals and everybody seamlessly coordinating that care together. And then the third piece of this is really care customization. This is moving from that population-based paradigm where we sort of guess if this is the right treatment plan for you or the right care plan for you based on statistical studies of people in a randomized clinical trial some decades ago or, or some even five years ago. But we don't really know whether what was true for the masses is true for you as an individual. And this is care customization is going to include everything from is my care plan part of my record and everybody knows it so they know that we're all working towards the same goals that I have as a resident or as a patient. And on the other end of the continuum there's increasingly capabilities with technology where genomics and understanding your genetic likelihood is going to change the game for long-term care because we're going to have some predictive ability of knowing what's coming and even being able to customize treatments for your particular genetic makeup and for your particular biology at that moment. And what role do you see electronic health records playing in this process? The electronic health record is a ticket to be able to play in the future of healthcare. If you don't have all of this data digital, then you can't do virtual care that, that Care Anywhere requires in a confident and in a trustworthy way. You can't do care networking because you can't have all eyes on the team on the same data if it's not digital and shareable and secure and so forth. And you certainly can't do care customization because the, the key to care customization is that you're going to build complex models, statistical models, for an individual. We will each have a patient model based on our genomics, based on our past medical history, based on our care goals, and computing and analytics will help the, the care team to make some decisions about what your specific needs are. None of that can happen if we are stuck in a world of paper records and fax machines. And the EHR is the precursor to, to the world of personal health. All right, so Eric, what makes technology so difficult to embrace if it makes such an impact? Well, I, I think people are sort of starting from the problem from the wrong direction. If, if you start with technology, then you're probably going to end up being frustrated. I, I work for one of the largest technology companies in the world of Intel. Um, at Intel, we don't necessarily start with the technology. I'm a social scientist by training. I have a team of people who study long-term care facilities, clinics, hospitals, patients' homes around the world. We start with the real needs of people, whether that's the staff who are frustrated with how, few, how many residents or how many patients they need to see in a day and don't feel like they can deliver quality of care, or whether that's residents or patients who feel like they're just a number and a factory line of care and they don't really have any personalization or relationship with the people that are seeing them. I mean, everybody's sort of frustrated. 
But if you actually start with understanding the needs and the unmet needs of people and the users of the systems, you'll get to a better place with the technology. So what we're, what we're seeing is um, long-term care facilities and clinics and hospitals hearing about electronic health records, they're hearing about all the hype around big data, and, and hype around big data is important because it's a game-changing technology. They're, they're hearing hype around the cloud and moving data to the cloud, and they feel like, I've got to have some of that. And what they really ought to be focusing on is what are the three to five things that we're going to do that are going to help our care model to improve the quality of life for the residents and our care model improve the quality of life for the people providing care for those residents. And what's the business business model to support those, you know, magic changes that we want to make? And then third and finally come to the question of, all right, what technologies do we need to enable those great experiences? This is called experience-driven design. And and you know the ironic thing is a lot of the technology companies use experience-driven design to develop our technologies but the users and purchasers of those, of those technologies are not having a very experience-driven approach. So I would advise every long-term care facility to have an experience roadmap that says, over time, these are the three to five activities or experiences we want to transform for our residents, and these are the three to five you know, transformations or experiences we want to make for our staff. They should have a clear reason why they want to do that from a business perspective. It has to be financially sustainable for them to be viable. And then they sit down and ask technological experts what kinds of infrastructure, what kinds of tools are needed. Because at the end of the day, technology is just a tool. And you better know what problem you're trying to solve before you bring the tools to the table. Excellent advice. Now, I know our attendees are confronted with a ton of technology that's out there. Do you have any suggestions on how to filter the good from the great? Well, I think if you if, if you have a clear idea of the experience roadmap that you want, w one of the things that I observe, particularly in long-term care, is that we have people who are not technology experts trying to make decisions about technology. Not you know some some long-term care providers are large enough to have their own chief information officer, their chief technology officer, and that's great. And those are people who are qualified, presumably, or come from a technology background and can help suss out. What, which pieces of infrastructure are really needed and which ones are not, which ones are going to integrate well with what we already have and which ones are not, and which ones are going to have staying power and which ones are going to be ones that we're going to have to then spend a lot of money and hassle in a few years to upgrade. I mean, all of those are factors that anybody as a CIO or a CTO background would have. I think for smaller organizations, if they're going to take the expense to invest in some technology, then they, they should first invest in some outside counsel and expertise from consulting firms or you know there's I'm, so many local health IT consulting firms so this doesn't have to be big budgets big dollars to help guide them on here's the technology roadmap to solve your experience roadmap you, you you can be tempted to adopt the latest greatest thing coming from some startup and startups are great because they fuel the innovation economy and and they're very important but those are risks right if you've got a small vendor who you've never heard from before coming in and promising you the moon, well, all caution should be on because you, you have to ask yourself, I'm investing in infrastructure that I don't want to have to redo again in three or four years. Is this company going to be around? Do they have a reputation? It, it, just like anything else you would make as a purchase for yourself, you ought to be asking for um, case studies that they've got from previous customers, be allowed to actually call those customers and talk to them, and don't just ask about the technology, but ask about what was the support plan for the technology, what was the cost of installation. Particularly with electronic health records, people start looking at just the cost of the initial deployment, and they're not actually looking at the total cost of ownership and the long-term costs, and you know, if an upgrade comes in and this is another tranche of cash and another hit to our productivity because it takes two months for everybody to learn the upgraded software. All of those things need to be taken into account when you're when you're doing this. But the key is just to have a good technology plan. And too often it feels like somebody's been given some budget and said you need to go get us on the cloud and there's not a clear reason why um, and there's not a sort of technology plan for how to implement it in fits and starts or in phases that are manageable. What would you say are the characteristics of long-term care organizations that are early adopters of technology? Well, the early adopters I've seen in long-term care have a clear vision of what they want to become, right? I mean, they know that their their business for the last hundred years has been primarily, um, you know, and I don't mean to mean this in a derogatory way, but the essence of their business has been 
landlord and care provider. And what I think what a lot of them are quickly discovering is that they can be care provider without necessarily having to be landlord, right? And, and this is back to that theme of care anywhere that I talked about with personal health. It, we've certainly seen as long-term care providers have moved to CCRC models, you know, where they now have a continuum of care and they're realizing that they can and they must deliver services across a continuum that ranges from homes and apartments of individuals to homes and apartments that the CCRC owns and manages to nursing home facilities that are a lot more like clinics or hospitals. Treating all of those domains of care the same doesn't make sense, but being able to have the flexibility of staff and services and technology and software that allows you to seamlessly shift your resources across those kinds of domains, that's the future. And actually this is one of the places where long-term care actually has an advantage over the rest of healthcare. Long-term care ha already knows how to deal with people in residential environments and the challenges of delivering complex care in those environments. Long-term care already knows how to deal holistically with the needs of people from their meals to their mental health to their medications. And long-term care actually does long-term care, right? It's not just episodic post-based care and they can be thinking for the long haul and um, helping to sort of steer people on a path to, for their care goals. The rest of healthcare, hospital care, you know, clinic care, has to learn how to do the things that long-term care already knows. So those long-term care organizations that understand what their assets are and that they already know a lot about um, sort of doing care anywhere and facilitating teams and offloading care to family members in formal ways, those are advantages that long-term care has. They have to have a clear vision of what they want to be um, going forward. They, those, those early adopter organizations have a clear idea of what they want the technology to do for them, whether they call it an experience roadmap or not. When I sit down with them and talk to them about what problems they're trying to solve, they've got a long list and they know which ones they're doing and what order they are and they know which ones they'll do next and they evaluate and update that list on a yearly basis, sometimes even on a quarterly basis. The other thing I see long-term care early adopters doing is they have a way of scaling their innovations. You know, they know that they need to start out with a prototype of a new care model and a technology, say telehealth, for example. And then they know that they'll prototype that and try out little pieces of it, and then it'll get good enough for them to pilot it for real with a certain number of people. And then they know what they were trying to solve in that pilot and measure whether or not it was successful. So they, ha they know at that point whether or not the pilot is ready to scale to the whole organization, or they need to go back to the prototype phase because something wasn't right in the pilot. The, the folks who have a clear innovation pipeline and a clear process for knowing, okay, we're in prototype phase, now we're in pilot, pilot phase, we're now going to scale the whole organization, and they make that clear to everybody, they tend to succeed better as opposed to organizations who are like, oh my gosh, we need to do something innovative, and there's no framework or owner in their organization or process for actually doing innovation. And the last two pieces I see is that some of the long-term care organizations who, who succeed really put mixed discipline teams on the problem. So they'll bring somebody with a technology background, somebody with a finance background, and somebody with a care background, if, if not more, and they put all of those perspectives on whatever problem is trying to be solved. Too often with technology projects, it's sort of the technical person taking the lead and the clinical people and the frontline staff people and the finance people may not be bought in. Or it may be a finance-driven innovation where they're coming in and saying, we need to save money in this particular domain and that's what's driving it. It doesn't matter where the innovation starts. It's totally fine for it to be finance-driven or technology-driven or care model-driven. But the reality is you need mixed discipline teams from within the organization not only just for buy-off on the innovation, but to make it work, because each of those people has perspectives that none of the others can see. And then the last piece of this is they've got to have an innovation pipeline, they've got to have mixed discipline teams. They, they need to have a process by which they do change management. If you're going to suddenly scale something that you've been prototyping and piloting and say, okay, doing virtual care is now going to be a fundamental thing that we want all of our staff to do, they have to have a change management plan that says, how do we get from here to there? How quickly are we going to do it? How do we woo the early adopter supportive nurses and staff first, and then how do we fan it out? How do we do the training and and have a long-term commitment? I mean, a lot of folks are like, okay, we, we press play on the new technology and immediately transform the organization overnight. Or after three months, they're frustrated because people didn't love it. It takes six months, nine months, sometimes a year and a half to two for a culture to get used to a new way of doing work and to get comfortable with a new technology and to exploit all of its capabilities. So 
So if you give up at month six or seventh or eighth, then you you've, you were probably just three months from actually it working well, and you just didn't actually give it long enough and didn't have a change management plan. I want to thank Eric for fitting our interview into his busy schedule. I know that the information he shared with us is enlightening and helpful to those who have joined our call today. So thank you so much, Eric. Now let's turn our attention to Joe Velderman. Joe serves as Provident's Director of Consulting Services and is a vital resource to their clients, assisting them with strategic planning and the implementation of contemporary technologies in order to help providers remain an efficient and viable force in the healthcare field. Joe works on site with clients and well represents the personal approach that Provident takes when empowering all customers. Joe also serves several of Provident's long term care clients in the role of Director of Information Technology where he's able to provide them with special attention and guidance in effectively applying current technology to their companies to ensure competitiveness in the industry. Welcome to the webinar, Joe. It's great to have you with us here today. Oh, thank you so much, Lori. It's great to be participating today. Now, folks, Joe is going to get us started by talking us through the differences between electronic medical records and electronic health records followed by a discussion of benefits for deploying technology in healthcare and sharing as well some case studies. So Joe, um, over to you to help us make sense of what I like to call the alphabet soup of EHR and EMR. Yeah, let's take a look at the difference between that one letter and those two acronyms. I think some people use the terms electronic medical record and electronic health record or EMR and EHR interchangeably. But I want to point out that the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology uses the term electronic health record almost exclusively. And while this may seem a little bit picky at first, the difference between the two terms is actually quite significant. The term EMR came along first, and indeed early EMRs were just medical records, and they were used uh, primarily by clinicians, uh, mostly for diagnosis and treatment. In contrast, I think the word health relates to the whole condition of being in sound body, mind, and spirit, especially freedom, uh, freedom from physical disease or pain. The general condition of the body is what health relates to. The word health covers a lot more territory than the word medical, and EHRs go a lot further than EMRs. So let's first talk about that first term, EMR. Uh, EMRs are sort of a digital version of the paper chart in the clinician's office. An EMR contains the medical record and treatment history of the residents in one community or organization. EMRs have advantages over paper records. For example, EMRs might allow a clinician to track data over time or easily identify which residents are due for preventative screenings or checkups, sort of that predictive care model that Eric Dishman was just talking about. EMRs also allow clinicians to check how their residents are doing on certain parameters such as blood pressure readings or vaccinations and they allow uh, the clinicians to monitor and improve the overall quality of care within the organization. But the information in an EMR doesn't travel easily outside of the organization. In fact, the resident's record might even have to be printed out and delivered by mail to specialists or other members of the care team. So Joe, it almost sounds like an EMR is not that much better than a paper record. How about we take a look at each EHR? By contrast, uh, electronic health records, or EHRs, do all of the same things that an EMR do, but they go farther. EHRs focus on the total health of the resident, going beyond the standard clinical data collected by an organization, and inclusive of a broader view on residents' care. EHRs are designed to reach out beyond the health organization that originally collected and compiled the information. They're built to share information with other health care providers such as labs and specialists, so they contain information from all of the clinicians involved in the resident's care. The uh, National Alliance for Health Information Technology stated that EHR data can be created, managed, and consulted by authorized clinicians and staff across more than one health care organization. The information moves with the resident to the specialist or the hospital or the physician's office. It can even move from one state to the next state or even across the country. In comparing the differences between record types, HIMSS analytics stated that the EHR represents the ability to easily share medical information among stakeholders and to have residents' information follow him or her through the various modalities of care 
engaged by that individual. EHRs are designed to be accessed by all people involved in residence care, including the residents themselves. In fact, having the resident be able to access their own medical record is an explicit definition in stage one of meaningful use for EHRs. And that really makes all the difference because when information is shared in a secure way, it becomes more powerful. Healthcare is the team effort and shared information supports that effort. After all, much of the value derived from the healthcare delivery system results from the effective communication of information from one party to another and ultimately the ability to, of multiple parties to engage in interactive communication of information. So yes, the difference between EMR and EHR is just one letter, but in that one letter I think there's a huge world of difference. So true, so true. And uh, Joe, can you give us a real world example? Yeah, absolutely. I want to go ahead and relate this in a real personal way. About six months ago, I established a Microsoft Health Vault account. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a free electronic health record that Microsoft has developed, and it's, it's really gaining a lot of traction for individuals to manage their personal health. Uh, health Vault is considered my EHR, but I can activate apps within that Health Vault to gain information from clinical records, physical devices, or pharmacies, um, or, or other data points. My hospital and physician have recently integrated their EMR software with Health Vault and allows their patients, like myself, to log in and view their personal health record. And we can view diagnosis information, care plans, and treatment plans. I also have a Fitbit pedometer that syncs up with my iPhone and allows me to capture physical health metrics that relate to my activity and sleep habits each day. Any prescription medications that I may need to take are stored in the Walgreens database and my prescription information flows into Health Vault as well. I recently received a Withings blood pressure monitor that allows me to check my blood pressure from my iPhone and I have that information also flowing into my health record. So basically this Health Vault application that Microsoft has come out with is, is the EHR. It's just a network for collecting multiple data points and forming the comprehensive health record. So Joe, it, this term EHR is feeling a, a bit like the wild, wild west right now. And Are there any government regulations that our attendees in long-term care should be keeping an eye on? I think the answer to that is kind of. <laughs> hmm. the, uh, the government wants to shift the health industry into the digital age, and it's provided reimbursement incentives and electronic medical records deadlines to those who, who adopt electronic medical records. However, as with all government benefits, the EMR mandate comes with strings attached. And for those who don't meet the EMR deadline for implementation, the government has laid out a series of penalties. Healthcare providers can qualify for Medicare and Medicaid EMR meaningful use payments under the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Care Act, also known as the HITECH Act. And that HITECH Act is also part of the ARRA, or the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 shortly implemented after President Barack Obama took office. The terms ARRA and high tech are often used interchangeably when referring to these federal EHR incentive payments. Eligible professionals can receive as much as $44,000 in EMR EHR incentive payments over a five-year period through Medicare. And under Medicaid, eligible professionals can receive as much as $63,750 over six years. Providers can choose to apply for whichever EMR or EHR incentive programs they're eligible for, but they can't apply for both. It's also important to note that there's no federal mandate or incentive for nursing homes, home health programs, or residential living facilities to implement EHR. Hence, the upcoming federal deadline for EHR implementation doesn't apply to providers of long-term and post-acute care. Recently, I think there's been some confusion among CAST and leading age members about the federal requirement for EHR implementation. This confusion has led to concerns that about the January 2015 deadline for EHR adoption facing health care professionals and acute care hospitals that are eligible for the EHR incentive programs. The Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive programs were authorized by the High Tech Act of 2009, and these programs provide incentive payments to eligible participants that demonstrate they are making meaningful use of EHRs. The incentive programs began in 2011, and eligible participants that do not successfully demonstrate meaningful use of EHRs will be subject to financial penalties beginning in January 2015. 
Long-term care providers are not eligible to participate in the incentive programs, and therefore these providers are not required to implement EHRs and will not be subject to the penalties in 2015. I think as of today, Minnesota is the only state that passed legislation mandating that all providers, including long-term post-acute care providers, have until January in 2015 to implement the EHR. So even though there aren't mandates for most states, can you walk us through some of the advantages for deploying healthcare technology and why it's important to get on board early? Yeah, absolutely. With a fully functional EHR, all the members of the care team have ready access to the latest information, allowing for a more coordinated, resident-centered care. For example, with an EHR, the information gathered by a primary care provider tells the emergency department clinician about the resident's life-threatening allergy so that care can be adjusted appropriately even if the resident happens to be unconscious. A resident can log on to his own resident record and see the trend of the lab result over the last year, which can really help to motivate him or her to take his medications and keep up with the lifestyle changes that have improved the numbers. Another example might be the lab results run last week. They're already in the, resident, in the record to tell the specialist what she needs to know about running the duplicate tests. The clinician's note from the patient's hospital stay can help inform the discharge instructions and follow-up care can enable the resident to move from one care setting to another much more smoothly. I think really the federal effort to encourage the adoption of comprehensive EHRs doesn't go far enough. That's because post-acute care providers like skilled nursing facilities aren't among the potential direct recipients of that ARRA incentive money. They should be. I think more than 26,000 Medicare certified providers, SNFs among them, service more than one half of Americans in their lifetimes. And part of the problem stems from confusion over how or where resident data should be stored electronically, going back to EMR versus EHR. The distinction between those two is key, and the correct answer is EHR. The difference is interoperability. This is all great information, Joe, and how about we round it out by taking a look at a case study of an early adopter? Yeah, sh sure. In, uh, in late 2010, the CEO of one of Provident's CCRC customers located here in Illinois decided that his organization wanted to blaze a trail to electronic health records. The customer recognized early on the tangible benefits of an integrated care model supported by the EHR. And the customer's objectives were simple. They wanted to improve resident care, integrate resident health records with local hospital and their physician group, they wanted to produce uh, reduce prescription medication waste and also to provide better business intelligence to improve revenue. Not much different than the poll questions that we asked at the beginning of the webinar. With the support of the residents, the team set out to implement a comprehensive electronic health record and share resident information seamlessly and securely. Their CEO stated, we want our residents to be able to be transported to the hospital in an ambulance without waiting for someone to print their chart and set it on their chest. Our customer decided to work with their existing resident management software application and build upon the features that the software offered through the various application modules. The first step was to roll out a more comprehensive MDS data collection method. And so CNA touchscreen devices were deployed on mobile computing stations. This allowed the aides to wheel a workstation into the resident's room and collect vital statistics on the resident track any activities of daily living that were administered. The next steps involved working with the clinical staff to deploy physician order entry, electronic uh, medication and treatment administration. By collaborating with Provenet's team of experts, our customer was able to successfully launch a full electronic medical record within a matter of, of a few months. Once these advanced clinical features were implemented, the software could really produce a continuity of care document or CCD. And that CCD can be electronically shared through a health information exchange engine. Presently, this Illinois customer is working with their local hospital group to exchange the, that continuity of care document. And I want to point out a few uh, tangible benefits from implementing the uh, EMR. As a result of implementing the EMR, a customer was able to see a 93% decrease in order entry time. They were able to recognize about a $1.31 increase in revenue PPD or per patient day. Uh, they were able to train their CNA staff in like five minutes. 
and they were able to experience about a 30-day decrease in accounts receivable. Additionally, they were able to recognize an approximate 50% reduction in documentation time, and they were able to see about a 48% reduction in medication errors. Really big changes as a result of implementing EMR. Moreover, the staff have begun to appreciate the adoption of EMR, and it has attracted top-tier talent to this CCRC. The aides really like completing their activities of daily living on the mobile computing stations because it's simple to navigate, easy to interpret, and efficient in their workflow. Because of its integration efforts with the local hospital, our customer now receives 97% of its referrals from the hospital. And conversely, the hospital has found a trusted post-acute care provider that it can feel great about recommending to its patients. Part of the EMR application that Provident implemented included a physician portal available through an iPad or iPhone app. The physician can securely log into the EMR application and review a resident's chart, vitals, diagnostic information, and orders before making the call to send them to the hospital. Our customer now understands that the investment in EMR has allowed their associates and their partners to work smarter and more collaboratively with their partners. Our customer has positioned itself to be a premier provider connected to a world full of health information technology. And throughout the implementation, we all realize that there are a lot of unanswered questions that linger, particularly surrounding interoperability. There's not a definitive federal government standard for exchanging information yet. Several regional health information exchanges, or HIEs, have spun up. And some states have begun to uh, identify some regulation on exchanging health information, but not all of them. This is a very interesting time for healthcare and for long-term care. We work in the most regulated industry in America, but that regulation doesn't mean that our organizations receive adequate funding for resident-centered care. Many of us see profound benefit to adopting an electronic health record, not only from an efficiency standpoint, but more importantly from the standpoint of being able to extend the continuum of care. Because of this benefit, we have a desire to move forward with EHR. And because this technology is changing by the day, achieving measurable success or definitive completion seems more difficult than hitting a moving target. Lori, I really view EHR as an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity for all of us to establish a very solid foundation for physicians, hospitals, caregivers, providers, and even residents to be interactively engaged with the resident health record. It's an opportunity for us to leverage the advances in technology to provide better care in a more efficient manner. And I think it's an opportunity for us to lay the groundwork that will accommodate future technology and integrate a resident's health even more. It's a tall order, but the time for us to act on EHR is right now. Well, Joe, thank you so much. Fabulous information. Don't go too far because we will be calling you back to answer the questions that are flowing in right now from all of our attendees. So um, thank you again. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. We'd like to go right now before we do get to those questions to our second and final poll for today. So coming up on your screen, what are your challenges when it comes to implementing EHR? So again, go ahead and select your top two options in terms of your challenges. Is it perhaps no idea where to start? No clear understanding of what's involved? staff adoption, cost, or reporting. So which of these two top your list? 12% of us stating no idea of where to start, 31% no clear understanding of what's involved, 56% pretty considerable uh, citing staff adoption and our front runner here 73% saying cost, 13% saying reporting. It's interesting to see how your votes line up with the rest of the industry. Thank you for sharing it with us. If you would like a little bit more information on this topic, you maybe want to hear more from Eric Dishman. There are videos out there on TED.com and DSC.discovery.com. Just put a search in for Eric Dishman's name. Lots of information there. As well, you can visit the Provinet Solutions blog and website. You got the link there on the screen. This time I am going to ask Joe Velderman to step back up to our virtual podium and going to start with some of the great questions that are here in the queue. This first one I'm going to go to from Rebecca and uh, Joe. What needs to happen in order to move forward faster with requiring EMR or EHR in long-term care? 
Yeah, that's a really great question from Rebecca. I think that there's a few things that need to happen to really drive the integration efforts and legislation is certainly one of those things. I think if we can get the federal government to identify some standards for us, it'll be a lot easier for us to move forward with health information exchanges because right now everybody's sort of doing their own thing. There's, like I mentioned earlier, there's, there's some local HIEs. I think here in the Chicagoland area there's six or seven local HIEs that have developed yeah, and, and some states have begun to develop some standards for the HIE, but not all of them. Some of the software vendors are beginning to implement engines that can transmit and, and receive electronic medical record information. But really the federal government needs to step up and identify a standard for all of us to share this information and, and exchange this information. It's possible that Obamacare might drive some of that. That's that's a really big piece of legislation, and there may be something buried in there about health information exchange, or it may be a subsidiary of piece of legislation that comes out following the the implementation of Obamacare. I, I think one of the other things that's really going to drive health information exchanges, or the interoperability piece, is is the demand from a younger generation. If we go back to that slide that showed the HIE that I'm using with Microsoft Health Vault, that's going to be something that people are quite a bit younger are going to be you know, looking for. They're going to want to be able to go to a website and aggregate all of their healthcare information, whether it be from a physical device or a pharmacy or their healthcare provider, a hospital, or even a long-term care community. I think that the demand is really going to be something that drives that in the future. Really great question. All right, and it looks like Bill is asking, and this is why I don't think Bill is the only one with this question. It's probably floating around everybody's minds, but what about downtime and disaster strategies? Mm. Yeah, that's an important topic, right? Um, I, I think a lot of folks are looking to implement electronic health record and, and, and become dependent upon that electronic version of a, of a residence chart. And when you do that, there's a lot of things to consider. If your EMR is hosted outside of your building or outside of your organization, you really need to look at what what do you have in place in terms of, re, of a redundant internet connection? What do you have in, in place in terms of redundancy and power? If we're relying on computers to administer medications at 3 o'clock in the morning, for instance, and the power goes out because of a storm and the internet goes out, we're suddenly you know, stopped dead in our tracks. So we need to look at ways where we can put in redundancy when it comes to power and inter internet and, and keep our infrastructure powered up regardless of the circumstances. I think a lot of organizations are looking for ways to develop what I call a hot copy of their MAR and their census that they can still print out in the event of an emergency or a disaster. When we look at some of the things that happened on the East Coast with the hurricane last fall. A lot of organizations that had electronic health records were able to still get to the computer and do like a print right before the hurricane hit. And they were able to print off the medication administration information, the, ther the treatment administration record, and, and their census so that they could at least have a short paper record to see which residents were there and what sort of special instructions or treatment each of those residents required. And that's a really important consideration. I know Eric had mentioned that there's a number of technology consulting companies out there that help do this kind of stuff. But it, it's, it's, it's important to not just put in an EMR or an EHR application, but also have that disaster recovery aspect covered as well. All right, the next, next question coming from Brian. And Brian's asking, are there any good software system solutions emerging that will allow post-acute and aging services providers to track costs at the patient level? There are. There's, there's a, a number of really good software providers that are out there right now. If you visit that, that Provident website that was flashed up on the screen a little bit ago, we've got some great resources for helping folks make a decision on, on a software vendor. The CAST Commission through Leading Age has a really great online tool that, that helps folks to make a great decision about some of the top EHR vendors in the space today. In terms of tracking costs at a patient or clinical condition level, there, there are some applications that lay on top of some of the EHR applications that allow you to do that. 
Some of that work is still manual as these applications evolve. We're going to see a lot more of that business analytics. Uh, we're going to be able to do a lot more with the data points that we're collecting, and we're going to see a lot more of that uh, business intelligence coming from the applications. Okay. Cindy here has a question for you, Joe, and she's interested in knowing when do you predict uh, EHR to be federal, federally mandated for long-term care? Of course, uh, your opinion, of course, uh, I would think this will eventually have to happen. Any thoughts on that? I don't know if I can throw out a specific date or a specific month, but I, I think that it's coming faster than we all think. If you look at the other healthcare spaces that are out there, whether it be acute care health or even physician groups, some of the clinics that are out there, they're all being required to implement electronic health records and they're being required to share information as part of the meaningful use stages. And so I think as we work together in the healthcare space, we all sort of play in the, in the same playground, it's going to be a requirement for us down the road. That's only ha half of the equation. It can be a requirement, and that's great. But whether or not we'll receive any federal funding or state funding for that is really the big question. I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, I don't have a way to predict that. If I had to go off of my intuition, I would say probably not, but it's possible, I guess. Okay. I've got one here from Daniel, and Daniel's asking, how are monetary concerns addressed when trying to implement EMR or EHR when facilities are not for profit and often don't have extra funds for technology upgrades. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I received a similar question prior to the webinar too that was very similar to that. So long-term care is not unlike any other business really. We've got heavy regulations by the state and the federal government and, and the reimbursements that we receive from them, they really don't come close to meeting our costs to provide care. With less acute care models like independent living and even AL, the demands that we face from are from the residents. They want more and more features in their place of dwelling, but they don't want to pay for it either. I think the key for leadership is to look at how communities can leverage technologies that are driven by regulation with technologies that are desired by residents. A classic example of this is, is uh, the installation of Wi-Fi. You know, independent living and assisted living residents and their families want to have Wi-Fi available in their living spaces and care providers need Wi-Fi and skilled nursing to do things like real-time EMAR and ETAR. If we can leverage enterprise-grade Wi-Fi to provide virtual networks for residents, guests, and caregivers, we can put in a single solution for multiple needs. And some communities will even charge the residents a nominal fee for Wi-Fi usage that isn't close to what they would need to pay if they brought in their own service. You think specifically for EHR, it's critical for us to get good business intelligence out of our EHRs. And this is coming down the road. If we have great analytical and statistical information about our caregiving, it's easier to increase referrals from hospitals. And the hospitals are looking at for the post-acute care that is going to yield the fewest rehospitalizations. If we can use those business intelligence tools to prove how we accomplish that goal, we'll get more referrals from our competitors. I think lastly we need to ensure that our EHR platform is capable of providing care outside of the brick and mortar communities that we're accustomed to. Eric alluded to this in, in uh, his presentation as well. But if our EHR is compatible with home health, hospice, or even home and community based services, we can engage the residents earlier through the EHR. We're more likely to have that resident be committed to our organization for the duration of their care needs. Hospitals have begun to integrate their EHR applications with that, like with products like that Microsoft Health Vault and future residents like myself can begin to have more insight into our health record and keep us more engaged in our personal health. All right. Got one here from Robert for you, Joe. And maybe one should have a survey to ask how many already have an EHR. Many do. Would you share what you think regarding uh, the percentage of LTPAC providers with an EMR mm. and what percent with an EHR? My guess is their number is lower than the reality based on what I'm seeing. Really great question, Robert. I don't know how current my data is today, but I know that as of about the first of the year this year, there was a survey that went around, aggregated some of these results. And you're right, I think for me, 
the information that was gathered in that survey and presented was astonishing. Around the first of the year, less than 2% of long-term post-acute care communities in the country had a fully functioning EHR. Now, I think a lot of communities are really close to that. You know, even in the, in the case study that I talked about, the community that we're working with, they probably don't have a fully functioning EHR today because they can't really exchange that continuity of care document, but they're working on it. And I think that by the end of the year this year, they will have that fully functioning EHR. They're going to be integrated with their pharmacy and they're going to be integrated with the hospital that's in their neighborhood, working on some laboratory integrations, some radiology integrations. So, you know, once you get that many integrations, I think it's safe to classify yourself as having a fully functional EHR. Okay, got one here from Sarah, and she'd like to know, how do we improve staff transition and adoption of EHR technology? Probably, again, a few ways to do that. With anything new, it's important to have your staff feel comfortable using that. And the way that we make our staff feel comfortable with an EHR is to continue to do training. It, it sounds elementary, but training, training, training is really the key uh, for getting your staff comfortable using a new technology. And I think documentation goes a long way too. The staff will feel much more comfortable not only having training but also having a book or a manual that they can fall back on and reference in the event that they need to use that. I've seen some communities even come out with like a campaign when they roll out electronic uh, health records. The particular application that some of our customers use has, has a, a a CNA touchscreen piece and so some people have really played on that whole touchscreen aspect to get some buy-in. There was one a group that was pretty close to our office here and they they rolled out a campaign that was along the Star Wars theme of may the touch be with you and, and they got some of those those cheap swag items you know, little mini flashlights or whatever but it really increased the employee engagement in the project as corny as what it may sound I think a lot of the staff members felt like they were part of the implementation because they were a part of that campaign. And being a part of something and not having something forced upon you uh, really goes a long ways into buying into it. Okay, folks. Well, it looks like we're really getting up toward the top of the hour. I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity, Joe. Are there any comments you would like to leave the audience with today? I just encourage everyone to uh, really critically look at the whole future of electronic health records. I know we touched on that today. I think that Eric mentioned something that was really very important in his part of the discussion and that's relying on experts. This whole electronic health record implementation thing is new for everybody. You know, it's probably very much so like the automotive industry when the cars first began, began coming out at the turn of the century, the government was struggling to catch up with regulations and the first cars didn't even have seat belts and I think that's a little bit like electronic health records in that way it's new for everyone and it's important to look to the experts when it comes to implementing your own EHR and, and really critically think that through for your organization. Okay well thank you so much and folks we are at that time and uh, want to take a moment to thank each of you for joining us today Hope that you found today's webinar of value and you'll want to join us for future events. As mentioned, you'll be receiving a short survey at the end of the webinar, so please take a moment to fill it out. Additionally, for those questions that we couldn't answer on air, we'll work to coordinate responses for you post-webinar. A copy of today's recorded webcast will be made available as an on-demand viewing, and you'll each be receiving an email with a link to access this recording by next, uh, at some point next week. Special thanks to our guests, Eric and Joe, as well as our sponsor, Care Innovations, and our behind-the-scenes logistics producer, Tamara Williams, for making today possible. And again, as your moderator, this is Lori Dearman saying thank you, and have a great rest of the week. Goodbye for now.